And uh, we're going to take you today in the good to great emergency department from the uh, people who see the patient uh, before you do uh, and bring them to you and uh, through the uh, in-hospital environment and strategies for uh, being able to work with the people upstairs. That's frankly been more and more of a challenge for emergency department leaders as you get pulled into um, a position uh, having to assist uh, the upstairs leaders um, in managing um, volumes of patients coming in. Since you all are very good at managing the emergency department, oftentimes you get recruited into assisting upstairs staff in figuring out how to uh, manage uh, issues up on the floor. And uh, so congratulations. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen a couple of our really good people uh, who are emergency department managers who got recruited upstairs and, and essentially pulled away from the emergency department. It's a little frustrating. All right, my, uh, my uh, role right now is as medical director for DC Fire and EMS. Washington, DC, uh, 600,000 base population, 1.5 uh, during the day, 1.5 million during the day. Um, and then we do about 350 uh, EMS calls a day. Uh, so our volume's 350 for EMS. Uh, we have 40 frontline uh, EMS units uh, on the street every day and another 20 that we use for all the special events and other things that go on in, um, in the district. Uh, you can imagine that special operations uh, for our department is a very big one. Uh, we have to manage everything from the day-to-day -day protests uh, through to people who are, you know, are, are standing with simulated bombs uh, through to the uh, inauguration and the inauguration is a whole separate uh, uh, kind of a preparation. Uh, big, big, big incident operations are a very good part of the department there. I have learned a lot uh, in, uh, in dealing with uh, pre-hospital care uh, and then flip-flopped uh, what I have learned back and forth with the emergency department. And uh, this morning's uh, kind of bonus opportunity here is to, is to understand uh, this is not the pre-hospital care system uh, up, on, up on the chalks. And uh, again, uh, I say uh, the big stories on the news this morning on CNN, the, the discussion over health care reform and, and this kind of plan, that kind of plan. People are still going to wreck their cars. People are still going to fall down. People are still going to uh, have something that they think is a heart attack. And, um, and maybe that's even one of you someday or sometime, or it's Tiger Woods' uh, mother-in-law. Uh, but they, they have to call for assistance. And we're fortunate to have a group of people who are prepared to go in kind of anywhere uh, and deal with those emergencies. So that's what pre-hospital care is. Uh, why, why you should be interested in it as an emergency department leader, um, it is, it is uh, the future of our service again. And one, one thing I learned by, by working in the field is so much of what we do is, is so in, intricately intertwined uh, that you really can't break it apart. Uh, second of all, it's, it's, uh, it is very, very enlightening uh, to know what goes on in pre-hospital care and why we should listen to those people very carefully. Uh, there's nothing more enlightening. Um, the story is told about the, the uh, young lady who walks in with the Cheetos and the, and the uh, Pepsi complaining of abdominal pain, of course. Now, when you get out into somebody's home and you see somebody, uh, they, they call it shortness of breath, and you walk into the house through a cloud and you see it's a garbage can that they use with the lid turned upside down and filled with sand that's completely full of, of cigarette butts um, and, and they don't understand why they or their child is short of breath. Understand that's the experience that many of the pre-hospital people have and can contribute to you. Um, the patient-centric emergency care system really is, I, I think, where we would want to be in this country and allow people who, who use the system to help us in designing it. And then where, where do you find best practices? Uh, again, a, a, uh, a reminder, uh, in the old days, uh, sick people used to live right on top of the hospitals. Uh, and, and in the older hospitals that I have been a part of the community before, they used to define the couple blocks around the hospital was where all the doctors and nurses lived and where all the patients lived because uh, they couldn't be very far from the hospital. Uh, well, now people are allowed to go back home for very long distances uh, because there's something that will allow them to come back to the hospital if they need medical care. The uh, uh, definition of the emergency system, uh, this, this goes uh, upstairs for you guys. Uh, it goes to the uh, medical staff. It goes to the administration. I, I've always been amazed that, um, that 
uh, no matter what happened in the community, you guys as emergency people are supposed to know what happened. Uh, and so when you go to your, your, your walk to the dog and you're out with your neighbors uh, and they know there was a shooting in the community last night or a bad car wreck, who, you're, you're supposed to know about that, right? You're, you're, you, you know what happened, right? And, and the same thing with administration. They'll, they'll call downstairs, well, we, we heard there's a plane crash uh, out in the community somewhere. What do you know about it? Well, I, I don't know. I've just seen you know, 62 patients in the last hour here, and I'm not quite sure what's going on outside. You realize the community thinks that you are the emergency system and that you're out there as far as, as it can be and that you know everything about every patient that came through um, or are expected to be able to find out the information that they want. And uh, so these are really the customers uh, of the system. And in every other industry, they listen to their customers, all right? We, we sometimes go out of our way <clears throat> not to listen to our customers, uh, but in most industries, they go out of their way to listen to their customers. Now, if you really put together what the unscheduled care system is, here, here are the boxes uh, that you would put together. Uh, an unscheduled care system, uh, is supposed to, to respond to calls and the, and the call accesses 911 in most communities or whatever the primary public safety answering point is or PSAP. You're supposed to take care of trips to the hospitals, care at nursing homes, extended care facilities, uh, assist the police in whatever they're doing in most places whenever they're doing a tactical operation, EMS uh, is there with them. Uh, you're supposed to access and work with, the, uh, with uh, whatever uh, ask a nurse programs, um, home health care uh, uses EMS extensively. I think you guys know if you got two phone calls uh, at the same time and one was a home health care nurse and one was a paramedic and they both said uh, uh, we, I have a sick patient here, uh, what do you think about taking the phone call from that visiting nurse? Do you really think you got a sick patient there? What about the, the phone call from the paramedic? Do you really think you had a sick patient? I oftentimes, unfortunately, find that, that the paramedic really knows sick, not sick, a whole lot better. And, uh, and they have to work with the home health care system in a very polite, respectful way in figuring out what's going on and what may assist persons in an emergency environment. We work with doctor's offices and, again, support all those, uh, all those McDoctors uh, or, or the little boxes out there. Uh, we got called in, uh, they put a laser eye center uh, in a strip mall in our community and, uh, and one day they call because they got a patient who's crashing and uh, typical story here guys, uh, we can't get our carts through the doors because uh, the doors are all built too narrow. Now they got a patient, they, they do anesthesia for doing the eyes. Uh, they have somebody who's crashed and they have no resources to be able to take care of it there. Uh, and they haven't planned ahead to talk to EMS to know how they're going to access uh, there. And so we, we, had a, you know, we had a bad patient outcome. And uh, part of it is, is because we can't access uh, the patient in any way to get them in and out. And a whole bunch of related things. They're, they're doing all kinds of things in an outpatient environment. And, uh, and EMS is supposed to provide the backup. Um, and you guys are ultimately are the backup as well. When anybody crashes, they bring them in through the emergency department, typically. Uh, Dr. Bill German, uh, who was from Missouri and unfortunately died last year, um, he produced this comprehensive view of, of uh, what emergency medical services, and uh, I, I don't want to go through all these things. You, you know it includes elements from, from uh, aircraft, uh, phone systems, computer systems, um, backs up all the different clinical areas, et cetera. So there are really many elements to the pre-hospital emergency care system. In the same way, in many communities, they, they function as the all come. Whatever's wrong with somebody today, uh, if you call 911, the, uh, the people will come and they'll, and they'll take care of you. So just like the emergency department in many community hospitals, it's the all come center. Uh, so is it for EMS. Uh, a repeat of this uh, diagram, which, uh, which again, we, we are, we're lacking in longitudinal data in many of uh, emergency services areas. Um, one emergency department here, which I think represents a lot of emergency departments, over the years from 87, uh, this ends at 99, the same trek goes on through 2009, uh, we kept increasing the number of ambulances that were coming in the emergency department. And in this case, we went from about 9,000 to almost 18,000. Uh, patients arriving by ambulance in this emergency department. And I wanted to know what was the change in the admission rate for those patients. Well, the first year it's 36.5% and the last year it's 37.5%. 
So again, despite uh, increasingly stringent admission criteria, sick people still arriving by EMS. This was the key graph. Uh, this was from Dayton, Ohio. In Dayton, uh, the big employer is General Motors. General Motors uh, was, uh, was beginning to feel uh, like they were paying for the entire healthcare system of Dayton, Ohio, either through their active employees or their retirees. And they wanted to know why the emergency system kept expanding and why we were thinking about building a new emergency department. Uh, so General Motors makes decision based on numbers. So we had to put together the numbers for them to explain the emergency system. And of course, one of their people came in pointing their finger, it's, it's you guys, you're, you're inviting the drug seekers in here and they all ride in here uh, on the ambulances for medication refills uh, and you guys waste, waste uh, all kind of uh, money and resources. Um, and so we had to build the statistical package that allowed them to, to take a look at what we did. And again, I'll, I'll remind you, if you're going to ask General Motors or the equivalent in your town to come visit you, do you bring them in on Friday or Saturday nights? When do you bring them in? Monday at noon. Monday at noon. Okay? Um, and first of all, most Friday and Saturday nights aren't full of drunks and anything else any more than any other evening. Uh, but if you want them to know the challenges of running the emergency department, bring them in in the middle of the day during one of your busy days and ask them to take a look around. So we built a nice numbers package for them, invited them to come in to take a look at the ED, uh, and they happened to come in on a Monday when it was just chaos, you know, and all kind of very sick people around the department. One of their um, executives who came in, um, he, there was one of his exec friends who was there with his mother who was critically ill and, and they're practically bagging her in the hallway kind of deal again because all the beds are full. And so the two of them had a little interchange about the, you know, what the emergency system here, why are you here and, and uh, what are you doing, etc. So there's nothing that's better than getting people a little hands on and, and really nothing better than having numbers. Uh, to show them exactly what the state of the operations are. So you should know, all of you should know right off the top of your head, what is your EMS arrival rate, okay? 15 to 20 percent in many places. If you're a high acuity center, it's, it's higher, 25 percent. What's the admission rate uh, related to it? Now, a couple stories, um, and I'll pick on Carolyn again. I go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma has a very extensive and very sophisticated urgent care system, okay? And uh, many people who are sick get in their cars and they go to urgent cares. I, I go, uh, any ambulance who's coming in has a relatively higher risk of getting admitted to the hospital because the not very sick people in the community go to urgent cares. The contrast community, Dayton, Ohio, has almost no urgent care. Washington, D.C. has no urgent care. No urgent care in the District of Columbia. There is a very small Kaiser facility that really uh, sees a couple overflow patients a day. Uh, now, what do you think our use of EMS is in the District of Columbia relative to other communities? It's much higher. What do you think about the ED visit rate? Much higher, okay? The calculation that I did for the eight district hospitals are that we see about an extra 115,000 ED patients per year uh, because of the lack of urgent care in the community. Uh, and many of them come by ambulance because there's no good uh, transit systems that go right to hospitals. And so a long time ago, a mayor told them that if you push 911, you call, we haul. All right, and you should know those words. You call, we haul, uh, meaning that they don't turn anybody down. And the admission rates from the hospital and the admission rates for EMS units in DC, do you expect them to be high or low? They're very low, they're very low. Most of our emergency departments admit 25% of the ambulance patients. And there's a good reason, because low acuity patients come rolling in, either, either by other conveyance uh, or on an ambulance cart, and uh, they're not as sick as they are in other communities. And Tulsa was really, they had a very sophisticated urgent care system, and it pulled off a lot of the low acuity volume. So you need to know your numbers in your community, and you need to be able to compare them uh, and understand them extraordinarily well. You can build a diagram like this. I'll tell you up front, the, <coughs> the, usual demand, the usual demand for emergency medical services is about 100 calls per thousand population. And in most communities, regardless of what style their emergency medical service system is, about 20% of those calls result in no transport. So in general, they transport about 80 persons per year per thousand population. 
And for those of you who have fluxes in population that are really dramatic, uh, it's, a, it's a little hard to apply those numbers, but at the big population level, just so you understand, in general, 80% transport rates, the other 20% for whatever reason, they're just false calls or somebody's cleared by the time they got there or they refuse services because they, they, they don't want them or they wake up a diabetic who doesn't want to go, et cetera. So just good numbers there. And then you build this diagram. In some communities, the EMS is also responsible for doing transports between facilities. And, um, and in some cases, you rely on EMS to either move patients into your emergency department from another facility or to move them out of your emergency department to another place where they're going to get definitive care. <coughs> Again, I'll say <coughs> our customers recognize this as a system. Our current challenges, and here's where I would have had the other numbers in there, our current challenges in the system are the success story of preventing premature death. Uh, our next, our next uh, challenge is planning, uh, planning for the future of the emergency care system, and that's in design processes and people, and then finances have to follow. Uh, the emergency system of today is about 40 years old. Most, most systems were created late 60s, early 70s. You recall the early heartmobile programs and early defibrillation and all that. Uh, really, really, 1969 was marked as the, as the onset of those. And, Seattle and Miami, Florida, and in Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, and so they, they uh, began to put uh, ambulance systems together uh, and took it away from what industry, by the way, at that time? Just for the younger people who are here. Uh, it was the funeral homes. And the, and the legend stories uh, for people who were old enough in the field, uh, the funeral homes would get the, would get the calls. Uh, and, and particularly important were the auto accidents. And the first ambulance uh, hearse ambulance slash hearse would race to the scene and would get which which victim the dead victim you know the 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 this the spoils were to go there to get the dead victim because that was money for the funeral home and so the first ambulance would race there get the dead victim take them off and then the next arriving funeral hearses would pick up the the patients uh, the, the pictures of the stories with people just pulling them out of the cars and in their arms and throwing them in the cot and then racing off to the hospital and I, I am old enough to remember them bringing people in in those old Cadillac hearses doing compressions um, on, on people. So that really, that really was true for the younger people here. Uh, recall also, and we'll talk about people later, but this, this is the entry point for many people who have uh, a career coming in emergency care. And we can't waste all those people. Uh, if they get good experience as EMTs and want to further their education and become paramedics, want to further their education to become a nurse, hospital administrator, respiratory therapist, physician assistant, physician, whatever it may be, uh, this is a good entree point for a lot of these people. And one of my jobs is to help them build career ladders. I have 2,200 people I'm responsible for in Washington, D.C. Uh, and there's a, a, there's a significant number of them who want to go on to be professionals in the field. And my job is not only to make sure they do their job on a day-to-day -day basis, but that I feed them enough that they're interested in becoming uh, a healthcare professional in one way or the other. The components uh, of, the, uh, of the emergency care system, hospitals, pre-hospital care, and the providers, they do a lot of public health. And some people refer to them as the Homeland Peace Corps, because uh, in many cases they go out and solve problems and do things. And particularly when it comes to fire EMS, and I'll talk about system design in a minute, Fire EMS, they really are critical in, in taking care of a whole, whole lot of things that in other countries would be considered Peace Corps functions. Uh, system design is becoming very fire department heavy, and there's a couple reasons. Uh, number one, uh, it relates to customer expectations. When they call 911, they expect something to show up that will take care of their problem. Uh, in, in many communities, the call to 911 is not a very accurate one. In Washington, D.C., that, that is the unreliability of the call system. When somebody says uh, a favorite, favorite uh, uh, call is the, the, the person's fallen out, okay? They've fallen out. Well, well, can you define that anymore? No, they've just fallen out. Now, fallen out can be anything from, from a cardiac arrest, <laughs> seizure, fainting, uh, through to they just got tired and sat down, okay? And in some communities, some of you may live in places where they get very reliable information over the 911 system, and they can very, very explicitly send the exact resources there to take care of the problem. Uh, but uh, in, in many communities like ours, uh, the dude did something, 
she's fallen out. That's all the information you're going to get. And so do you have to overcommit or undercommit resources? You have to overcommit. You have to send something. Uh, and in many cases, the first response vehicle has become the, the ALS-equipped uh, fire engine. That's become a basic unit of service. Uh, and there's a three or four person crew uh, and, and budgets have gotten tight and so some places they've been cut. But it's a four person crew that showed up that's prepared to do everything from get the cat out of the tree, put out the fire, deal with the auto accident, deal with the person who's sitting down on a park bench and got tired, or deal with cardiac arrest. Uh, and, and they carry on that piece of equipment uh, the stuff that they need to be able to do that. Um, and and uh, piece two of this is does prevention work on the fire side? Absolutely, you guys are, are beneficiaries of that. How many, how many structure fire calls do you think we have a day in Atlanta, Georgia, and Washington, D.C.? How many structure fire calls a day in our big cities? Either one of them. Uno, one. Average is one structure fire call a day. And uh, car fires are becoming a lot less frequent. And, and so we have fortunately prevented. Now when fires happen, do we need rescue services available very quickly? Yeah, it doesn't do you any good to, to, to spread fire resources out very widely so that when there is a fire, uh, you don't have resources available. So, so they're geographically uh, developed a system um, for your tax dollars. And essentially every EMS system needs two sources of funding. They need funding for standby uh, to have resources available for a 24 hour day, 365 days a year and big events. And, and they get it some from user fees. Uh, and so, and some of you at the hospital level get the same thing. You have user fees that you use, but then there's some form of a tax subsidy that's used to take care of all the charity care. In most communities and in most not-for-profit hospitals, uh, it is the subsidy of not having to pay taxes. Uh, that allows your hospital to stay in business. And in some communities, there's a big discussion about that. And in some communities, uh, the for-profits pay a certain amount of taxes into the system. Uh, the, same, the same kind of financial architecture goes here. And then uh, what you have, my son is an all-hazards trained person. Uh, my son is a firefighter, paramedic, hazmat, rescue, uh, so he knows how to do tactical rescue and, and ropes and all that kind of stuff. That's an all-hazards trained person. And every day when he goes in, his, his uh, company commander, the captain, either says, you're on the medic, you're on the engine, you're on the ladder truck, you're on the rescue uh, across your 24 hours. Uh, and so in many communities, that's there, or he, or he takes a couple months assignment to one of the vehicles or the other. When they pull up at a scene, uh, the house is on fire, uh, he can go into either a rescue mode, going in, opening up, finding people, etc. He can go in with a hose, or he can go in with a first in bag and take care of somebody who's one of his buddies pulled out of the house. Um, and so that's the essence of all hazards trained. Uh, and I find after working with those people for 30 years, I really like not having to wade through people. Now, now what, what is it that you do? You got somebody sick that you're pulling out of the building. Now, what, what do you do today, fellow, fellow person? <laughs> Are you a paramedic today? He, he just grabs that person from me and takes care of them. Uh, and so that's, that's why and how and some, somewhat to do with the finances. The, uh, the system, we, we talk about systems, and this is how we put together an Institute of Medicine report card for our emergency department directors. Uh, and it says uh, the initiatives, there were one, two, three, four, five, six initiatives uh, that came out from the Institute of Medicine. We ask each of our ED directors to, to address these locally in their department. And, and then we, we ask them to look at what the level of the problem was, uh, their assessment and their solutions, and to provide this back so that we could assist and share best practices. And knew that if a couple people were dealing with uh, pediatric care uh, and had, had identified that as a significant problem in their emergency department, in their care system, uh, that we would, have, uh, we would have them share information back and forth. Uh, so the Institute of Medicine report card, a very important element of how you, how you sling together uh, the different uh, elements of the emergency care system. The people involved need a career ladder and, uh, and, and it's really good if you build people through that have system memory that you're not constantly churning people. It's really hard to run emergency care systems when you churn people way too quickly. Um, an ALS system versus a non-ALS system. Uh, you can go through and discuss the varying points and, and what's best or what's not. Uh, and then a significant discussion that I get involved in, what's the advantage of having people who are fire uh, and, and uh, EMS trained. 
And again, I will say working with many of them, you, you can't fluster them. You, you, can, you can put anything in front of them, they, they just take care of it. It's just another, another way of doing business. As opposed to somebody who's strictly a firefighter who says, well, I don't do that, or I can't do that, I don't know how to do that. Or strictly an EMS person who says, well, I, I can't get in cars and I don't know how to put breathing apparatus on and all those things. Let me say there's a couple specific areas that we work on together uh, and should address together. One of them is how we're going to use these new tools that are coming into our hands. Uh, we could talk about ultrasound appearing in the helicopters before it's in your ED. End tidal CO2 appearing in the pre-hospital environment before, before people know how to read them in the emergency department. The carbon monoxide meters, the, the CO oximeters uh, appearing in the field with the fire, fire teams before EMS can have them or the emergency department can have them. Uh, the number one presenting complaint and issue in pre-hospital care is again this presentation of ACS and the future solutions uh, re revolve around things like the AD lead EKG systems. Um, a lot of times we have technical difficulties training our paramedics how to put the leads on and you guys probably know of a couple stories in your ED where your techs put the leads on in, in reverse fashion and it shows an MI and you start to work up somebody and then you find out that it was lead problem. We really need to work on solutions, and one of the solutions is better tools. Uh, the 12 lead in the hand of the, of the pre-hospital care provider is a great tool, uh, but it's technically difficult to do lead placements uh, sometimes. Um, and for an all-male crew dealing with a female patient uh, is, is a big issue. And then we put together the systems, uh, the architecture I showed you the other day, where, it's, it, where we're better capable of sending people home with an automatic alerting device uh, and allow them then uh, to be able to access care very rapidly. Uh, we talked about cardiac arrests, and again, my expectation for my paramedics, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not resurrectors, okay? And, uh, and when, when they go out on a cardiac arrest call, um, uh, I don't want them to have a really high resuscitation rate because it would mean our cardiac care program in our community is a weak one, very honestly. And uh, for all the numbers and stories I told you the other day, we should be preventing cardiac arrests rather than going out and trying to think that we are gonna do long-term resuscitations on people in asystole. It simply is not gonna happen. All right, regional challenges, uh, extended care facilities, I present them again as a very high cost, very low yield uh, use of emergency services, both sending an ALS crew and an engine out for somebody whose hip fracture is three days old, and now somebody just called with a report to the, to the nursing home and says hip fracture, send them to the hospital, and they, and they send up the uh, flag and call 911. And, uh, and then they come to your ED and, and frankly, uh, you look at them and talk to the orthopedic surgeon who says, well, they don't need operative repair, send it back. Or even worse, many of the other, uh, well, we think they have a fever. My, always my favorite is the completely nonverbal, non-communicating patient who, get, who comes in in the nursing home sheet. The chief complaint is chest pain. Now, now how, how nursing home clinician did, did you have ESP? Did this non-communicating person somehow tell you telepathically that they have chest pain because, because they don't communicate? And, uh, but the chief complaint is chest pain. I, I just don't get it. Temporary shortcomings in, in building systems like that. Well, right now, nursing homes have no disincentive to push the buttons 911. And if it's Friday night or a holiday and they're, and they're dealing with too many patients on the floor when the nurse is called in, that's when they, they have what's called fossil rounds and they go around and decide who's the sickest, and then they send them off to the emergency department. It's a little crazy. We could make better use of mobile diagnostics and mobile therapy and so on. I'm at time, aren't I? Yep, okay. Let me, let me uh, wrap this up. Uh, the, the, uh, the challenge here uh, for you as emergency department leaders, you have to know what's going on before you get the patient and have to be able to integrate with them very closely. And obviously we talk a lot about the critical care and, how on the good side, you, you take all these really sick patients from the pre-hospital providers and move them through your system. And then we talk about the ED operations, which is part of what makes you good to great. And then, and then we have to talk about what happens afterwards, uh, admissions to the hospital and dispositions and all those kind of things, which are part of what Gene's gonna talk about later today. Uh, the pre-hospital care system also is your big advocate. And if you're looking to build volume in your emergency department, uh, you can easily do it uh, by befriending and working with the EMS people, and I gave you some suggestions in the handout here. Oh, by the way, on the opposite side, if you, if you really antagonize these people, what happens to the population of people that you see rolling in the door? Just, just so you know this, 
And, and just so everybody has a clear cognition, if you're in a competitive environment, you get the worst patients in the system. I will guarantee you, if you set out to antagonize EMS, you will see every person who's got a chemical dependency problem in your community. You will see nobody with insurance, uh, et cetera. And, and it, th that, there's no good to that. And I, I, every day I work to make sure that that stuff doesn't happen. Uh, but in, in some ways, some people have kind of asked for that. And I just have to ask for you all to realize what the, what the downside is. So um, it has been wonderful being in front of you. I have to go give a lecture at the residency program. And I apologize for leaving. Uh, it's been really nice spending time with you. Thank you very much. Okay.